Recording in progress, we're live. Um, so as I introduce um, everyone to our panelists, um, I'm gonna introduce, introduce everyone at once and then we can roll right into the conversation. So uh, first we have Sarah Wachter Betcher, uh, a leadership coach, author, and strategist dedicated to changing design and tech for good. She is the founder of Active Voice, a coaching and training company helping courageous leaders build healthy teams and sustainable careers that are true to their values, no burnout required. Sarah built her career in content strategy in UX and has written widely on tech and design. Her most recent book, Technically Wrong, Sexist Apps, Bias Algorithms, and Other Threats of Toxic Tech, was named one of the best tech books of the year by Wired. She's also the author of Design for Real Life with Eric Meyer and Content Everywhere, and has been published in the Washington Post, The Guardian, and McSweeney's. Thank you very much, Sarah, for joining us. Next, we have Dalen Moyer, a software engineering manager at Fast Radius. Prior to moving into a leadership role several years ago, she was a 20-year software engineer building systems in support of transportation and heavy manufacturing. She's built a network of electric vehicle charging stations, flight deck software for commercial jets, programming tools for heavy trucks, and control interfaces for electron microscopes. She leans heavily on that background as she builds and guides high-performing engineering teams from a place of empathy, trust, and authenticity. She and her wife live in Portland, Oregon, where they obsess over their 1963 ranch home and all things mid-century modern. She is proud to be a transgender woman, forging her own path through the world and finding ways to use her privilege to benefit others. Her life's greatest achievement is teaching her cat to stand on his hind legs and turn a pirouette. We need pictures of that. <laughs> and then last, but very much not least, Neville Poole's passion lies in guiding change that leads to transformation from strategy to implementation. She believes that collaboration, communication, and transparency are the keys to real change. It's all about building strong, lasting relationships with team members, clients, and community leaders. Neville's expertise includes developing and implementing lean value-based operating models, business process reinvention, and leading multicultural, multi-generational teams across small, mid-sized, and large complex organizations. All right, so with no more waiting required, I'm gonna let a few more people in from the waiting room and start us off with a, a broad question for our panelists that we're so excited for. Um, why do we even need to talk about courage in the workplace? I want to take that first. Well, I, I, I'll take the first part of this. I'll kind of take a pass at it, but I, I believe that courage in the workplace shows up in different ways. And I think it depends on your experience. Um, courage in the workplace for me was around being comfortable with sharing my voice in a room with people that did not look anything like me um, and not feeling like I had to be absolutely perfect. I had to say everything absolutely the right way. And I had to have the courage to be vulnerable that I could get a different kind of reaction than I was that I'm hoping to get. So being comfortable with what you know and who you are um, provides that courage to participate and to be able to feel um, open to being yourself in some of those kind of uncomfortable environments sometimes. So that's what courage in the work, that's why it's important, I think, that we should have this conversation. Yeah, and I think too, like as we continue to evolve this conversation around building workplaces that are diverse, equitable and inclusive, there is only so much we can expect people in positions of power and privilege to back off to create space. It is incumbent upon the rest of us to continue to sort of push them backwards because it's that they'll never step backward far enough, right? And so it's up to us to tell them how far back is enough. And we do that by showing up. We do that by speaking even when we're afraid to speak. And we do that not by being fearless. Courage, is, courage doesn't exist in a space of fearlessness, right? Courage only shows up when we are afraid. And it's those times when we have to most call on that courageousness to show up and say, this is the value that I bring. And if you are choosing not to recognize it, that's a you problem. 
I love this so much. I love what both of you have said. And I think kind of going from there, you know, one of the things I hear a lot about courage is that what people will think that that means is that they have to then be the one who's speaking up and standing up about everything all the time. And I don't actually think that's true. I think that it is about being able to be true to yourself and say, I know what I'm about and I I have the courage to actually step into that place and not try to like be somebody else, not feel like I have to buy into what other people believe around me. And then like, I, I think, for example, I think like <laughs> courage doesn't have to be standing up and doing more. It can actually be like setting boundaries and saying no. I think that can be an act of courage. I think that can help shift norms. Um, I think that courage can at times be walking away from harmful situations instead of continuing to stay in them. That takes courage as well. But I particularly think that one of the things that I want to see um, more people in tech, broadly speaking, and, and I think women as well, like take where they like figure out where you do have some power and bring your courage there. And to say, I think that a lot of times that um, people who have experienced bias in different forms and I'm guessing most everybody here has in one way or another, and many of you probably in a lot of ways, um, it can be easy to get to a place where you start to feel like anytime you speak up, it carries the risk and that you have to, like you start get making your world smaller, right? To protect yourself. And that is an understandable response because there is risk to being vulnerable and there is risk to being courageous. And to say, okay, where can I? find some courage and where can I affect change and where do I have power and to look for those opportunities versus getting stuck in all of the places where you maybe you don't have as much. And so I, that's something I really encourage people to think about is like, where do I have power and what am I doing with that power in that space? Because that's your that's your biggest opportunity to be courageous. Um, I, I think, yeah. oh, go, go ahead, sorry. I'd love to like build on that by asking mm -hmm. like Neville for specific strategies that you've seen like for helping people reflect on how do I know if I'm in an uncourageous workplace so where I'm definitively not in an environment that supports DEI initiatives how do you recognize that you're in that place and then kind of we get into the next steps of doing something about it but how do you first recognize and stop gaslighting yourself I guess that that's what you're experiencing yeah, I think one thing for um, my experiences have, well, my out the, my outcome has kind of changed uh, or, or my, maybe I use a different word, my approach has changed. So before I would come into a meeting or meet new team members and I would immediately find the fact that I'm the only person of color or the only woman in the room. And so that becomes my, that, that was the beginning of the experience that I would have. And so over time, I started to say to myself, what if I started to find what were the common things that I had with some people in the room? So that it wasn't, I didn't feel as defensive, like I had to be something else. And I just said, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I just, right now it's about coming in and figuring out where do, where do we have some synergies? Where do some things match up? I'm a big, football fan there could be a football fan in the room and all of a sudden we're you know we're showing it up about something like that but it's it's really more finding that comfort wherever you might be where can you find something that feels like you can use that kind of to Sarah's point you can use that thing that is is relatable to move forward in, in I wonder experience or in the conversations I wonder if that's from your background as well, Sarah, um, because I, I'm like hearing this and I'm like, okay, and UX, which is both Sarah and I's background is like, we have to start from a place of, of commonality, especially being in like the engineering space. Um, and Dalen maybe experienced this with your designers that you've worked at, with in the past from an engineering background is you have to talk about engineering when you're designing, otherwise they assume that you're different from them. So even just in that like job function kind of diversity, um, it's very hard to break into a space that is male dominated as a woman, for example, who happens to be a designer and any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, something you said there, Kaylin, I think that there's, um, I think there's kind of two sides to it. On the one hand, it's like, it's so valuable to identify some places of commonality to say like, oh, 
okay, this other person I'm meeting with, like, they're not necessarily so different from me. Can I find something um, that we can connect on? But I think what's really powerful about that is also that you're doing that partially for yourself, not just for them, not just for their comfort. This is about creating a sense of safety for yourself so that you can bring more of yourself to the conversation so that you can actually get your needs met too. Otherwise, what I see happening sometimes is it's like, it becomes like a contortionist thing, right? So instead of it being like, um, oh, I like football, he likes football, like we can connect on football and that'll help me feel comfortable being me. It's like, oh, I'm now like trying to connect on the other person's terms solely. And that's when we stay in the zone of very, it's very people pleasy, right? So it's like, we don't assert anything of our own needs in the process. So I think of it as like, it's such a helpful, I think that, um, it's a, such a helpful skill to be able to say, okay, can I find a place of commonality? But I would encourage you to all to really think about, and how does that commonality allow me to feel safe asserting what I need here and not just using it as ways to like make other people comfortable, which I suspect a lot of you already are very good at because we tend to train anybody socialized female to be very good at making other people comfortable, like from birth. Mm-hmm. So like, you're probably good at that one. Um, Odds are high that you've had to learn that one already. And this is an opportunity to be like, what am I doing to make myself safe in this place? Right. Which, um, Dalen, I have to make a quick comment about being a transgender person. Um, Mickey Demeter, who's another amazing transgender, like outspoken supporter um, and is a transgender woman herself. She's spoken before about how exhausting it is to, um, how it can be exhausting although rewarding to be the person that speaks up and stands, um, talks about being transgender and, and gives um, the this, this space and the focus to talk about it that no one else is doing. Um, so maybe that's part of it too. And, and being a woman in tech or being a black woman in the room and just that maybe the weight of that um, being tapped into being courageous because when you stand up to be courageous in a situation like that, then you're opening the can of worms to every time this happens in the future, people are going to expect that I'm that person that says something. So maybe Dalen, you can talk about your experience with that. And thank you again for, um, to everyone here, to Neville and Dalen, just for, and Sarah, for standing up and being that person to talk about this because it is difficult and it is a can of worms because of the environment we're working in. So thank you for It can be messy. And, I really resonated with uh, Neville's words earlier about being the only one in the room. Like, I think a lot of us have experienced in one way or another being the only one of something, right? And when that, when that attribute of yourself is, what, is something you can't hide, you are faced with a choice, right? You can choose to be an apologist about it or you can wear it like a crown. And those like, those are your choices, right? So, I mean, I've always chosen the latter because I, I spent too much of my life apologizing for things that I didn't need to apologize for. And the last thing I need to apologize for is being a woman. That's not a thing that, that, that I'm sorry about, right? And, and so, it does mean that I take on a certain amount of additional burden optionally to advocate for myself and to advocate for women like me. Um, And to do, uh, to take on a lot of the emotional labor and education effort that goes along with that. I am for many of the cisgender people that I know, I am the only transgender person that they know. And so I become their, their Google. I am their transgender Google, right? And it takes some, some courage on my part to say, no, that's not my job. All of those answers are available to you on the internet please go look it up and then bring your secondary questions to me or ask me about my experience, but don't ask me to advocate for or speak on behalf of the transgender community because the transgender community 
like the black community, like the uh, autistic community, like the spectacles wearing community, it's too broad. No one person can speak for it. Right, so the, the challenge then becomes for me to understand where the responsibility I have chosen to take on ends and how to gracefully say, that's as much as I'm willing to offer you. Um, and that, that is its own special kind of courage. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Dalen, because sometimes I, you know, early on in my career, I was very hesitant because I'm an internal processor. So I could be sitting in a conversation with people and we're talking about some new thing that we're going to do. And everybody's kind of like, oh, yeah, this is this. And, and I'm usually pretty quiet. I have, a, I have a pretty big personality personally, but when I'm working and I'm thinking, I, I have to process internally. I don't talk and process at the same time. So I always felt like, my voice was never really heard because I never wanted to, like I would wait until I could figure it all out before I said something. And I had to learn that it's okay to talk about what you're thinking while you're thinking it, or it's also okay to say, listen, you, I have an opinion about this. I'm not quite ready to share it. You, you guys, you know, you all keep going. Um, I'm still kind of putting it together. And when you say that, I felt free to not feel bad or not feel like they thought Neville didn't have an opinion or Neville doesn't understand or Neville is not saying anything. Um, Cause I would have this one guy, he was loved him. His name was John. And he would always say, well, Neville, what do you think? Like right in the middle of the conversation, I'm like you don't have to ask me what I think I'm, I'm thinking right now. I'm not ready to share it. I'll let you know when I'm ready to share it. But those kind of being authentic, like being authentically you using your personality, if you are an internal processor, then just say it like like just be cool with saying your truth speaking your truth no matter what environment it is because people will respect it some mm -hmm. people won't and you can't have you can't change those people you got look they let them kind of do their thing live in that world that of unhappiness that they want to live in but in my world like i'm gonna say i'm not yet there yet guys so i'm gonna keep thinking through this so that's just something that's always been a challenge for me because of the way i do process information that really resonates for me and i know for me like a lot of that hesitation to share my processes was about being right or being yeah. perfect or being being able to articulately completely and with great detail explain my thing <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. And so on the one hand, being OK, saying I have a thing, I'm working on it and I'll share it when I'm ready and balancing that with giving myself permission to be incomplete. And realizing that everybody in this room who's talking right now is just as incomplete and just <laughs> as flawed and just <laughs> as imperfect. And yeah. it's OK for me to join that. Yeah. What I love about what both of you are saying too is that it's um, so much of this, so much of this conversation about courage is really about also recognizing where you have choice um, and taking it and saying like, okay, it's not, I'm not like I'm not obligated to speak up on behalf of my group because I happen to have this identity or like I'm not obligated to always be the one who's like, hey, what about, hey, what about, hey, what about? I get to, I can choose to do that in the times when that feels meaningful to me when that feels like an energy that I have to give. I can choose to step back from it at times when particularly if you're talking about like advocating for things that are like you're a member of the group that you're trying to advocate for and that group is historically systematically disempowered. It's like you it is not your burden to always be that one. It is a choice and you can decide how much energy to give it. And the same with like speaking up in a, in a conversation. It is again, it is a choice, right? You do not have to I one of the things I hate, sorry, let me step back. One of the things I hate <laughs> is women's empowerment type programs that tend to be like, just say it, have no fear. And you just need to get on that stage and speak up and Lean like in. as if, right. And like, and, right. And it's very one note. And it's as if somehow you owe that to the world. And I think that it's really valuable to say, 
I want people to feel like they have the choice to do it's toxic positivity. Yeah, like you have the choice to do it. And there might be consequences and there are trade offs. And it doesn't always have to be you. But when you feel called to do it to also know that you're allowed and you're allowed to do it imperfectly. And what you have to share is still valuable and important, even if you don't have like, a perfectly prepared three point plan that you pull off the top of your head. <laughs> but it's about recognizing that you do have some choice there and that you are not like this is not about your obligation. Um, this is about being able to share the parts of yourself and the ideas that you have with the people that you feel have earned them. And sometimes people haven't earned it. Like they just haven't fucking earned it and you don't owe it to them. <laughs> we'll that part out, but yes. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're good. Um, when you, it's, you know, in the right place at the right time, that's when it means something. Um, so thank you. I, I love that at the level that we're talking about this, like also thanking, you know, women's suffrage movement, everything that's come before this conversation to allow us to talk about it in like intelligently at the point that we're saying, yes, lean in was big for what it did. And it did a lot for women who are comfortable with lean in, but I saw there's also a book about lean out. And then it's kind of this like, um, polarizing this or that you're this or that way um to show up and be courageous in a room like now we're saying no there's a lot more nuance to that now that we can kind of accept as a general society that um women in tech or being another m minoritized group is uncomfortable and there are strategies to circumvent that now we're talking about at the level of okay now here are some different strategies for for creating that space in your unique way and your individual power is the right way to do it. It's not doing it the Sheryl Sandberg way or the Kaylin way, it's the individual person's way. Um, and then I do want to uh, move on to another question in here, kind of getting into some like practical takeaways a little bit. And I, I do wanna you know, wrap up a lot later in 30 minutes, but what are some practical things that people can do to ask for more from their manager or coworkers being in the workplace. So you've identified that there's an issue. Now, how do you um, ask for more from your coworkers or manager in a, in a certain way? Any thoughts on that? I don't know that there's a magic formula for that. I can speak mm -hmm. as a as a both both as a, I'm a middle manager, so I have a manager that I have to ask for things from, and people ask me. For things and in both of those relationships i find i get the best response and offer the best responses when when those requests are courageous like if you come to me and you hem and you ha and you're you prevaricate there comes a point at which I have to work so hard to understand what it is that you're asking for, that there's a good chance I'm going to misinterpret. And in many cases, if you were asking your manager for something, I don't want to say use as few words as possible, but I do want to say that you're, you will likely get the best results with a fairly straightforward approach, as opposed to a the ones that so many women, the approaches that so many women have been taught over the years, which is to talk around what you need, but instead say the words, right? Just say mm -hmm. the words. One of the things that I used to struggle with um, was I would, before I would go into a conversation that might've been difficult and I was gonna ask for something or ask for something to be done about something, I would always have this answer in my head that it was not gonna be the answer that I, was, that I wanted. So I would literally go in afraid that I was gonna get the answer that I didn't want, but that was the answer that I was kind of manifesting because I just kept thinking about, well, they're gonna say this or that. And so one of my all time favorite books, is the four agreements. And one of the four agreements is do not take it personal. So I had to disassociate what I'm asking for from anything that is a favor 
It's not a favor for me. If I'm asking about something that is either not right to be corrected, or I'm asking for something to be, you know, made right, it's not a favor to me. I'm asking because it's the right thing to do. So I, I, if, when I started to come into it with that thought, it kind of changed how I, how my emotions were going into that kind of conversation. So like, I have two daughters. I have a 15 year old and a 17 year old. My 15 year old is not afraid of anything. She will ask me, <laughs> can I do this? And, I, and I'm in my head, I'm like, you know, you can't, you know, you can't do that. But she asked it in a way that she knows she's getting it. And literally she <laughs> pretty much convinced me that, okay, Good for know, her. somehow. But my 17 year old, she is very introverted, very um, cautious. Um, and so she'll, well, you know, would it be okay if I, you know, and I'm, and I'm in my head with her, I'm like, yeah, of course you can. So it's, it's the dynamic of how you come into the conversation, how you position yourself emotionally to be ready to have that conversation. And the thing for me was that it is not a favor. You're not doing anything special for me. I am asking something that is grounded in fact. And there is, th there are things that need to change. And I believe that with my whole heart. So I can come and have a, a confident conversation with you about it. That's just a, a tip for me. It's also, it's about being able to say like, my needs are valid and whether you choose to meet them or can meet them or not does not is not like a referendum on whether my needs are valid in the first place like my needs get to exist they're they they exist and i can come to you and see what you can do for them one of the things i always think about i think self-advocacy is hard um i know a lot of people who um find it a lot easier to advocate on behalf of others than for themselves and oftentimes i find that um we socialize girls to believe that self-advocacy is selfish and that they're not being collective enough. Like they're not doing enough for others if you do self-advocacy. And I think that that's bullshit. I'm sorry. I did it again. I can't help it. Um, I can help. I can actually help it. But I, I will try to help it next time. Um, but, so I think, I think that that is not true. I also think that it's it's helpful if you have any of those feelings of, of guilt, if you try to do self-advocacy, that you're somehow not doing enough for other people. Something I would really recommend thinking about is like, what are the ways that my self-advocacy opens up more space for others? So what else can I make possible for other people? What are the like, what are the ways that me being able to advocate in this way could allow somebody else to have an easier path in the future? Just kind of thinking about um, the idea that if, oftentimes we think that somehow like if I get something, it's taking from someone else. And that's like, that is true in some scenarios where it's like there is there is one slice of pizza left and two people are walking up to it, right? Like, yes, if you take the pizza, there is no more pizza for the other person. But a lot of what we're talking about, it is not a limited quantity. It's like everybody deserves respect and we have an unlimited amount of respect, right? <laughs> so it's like, you're not taking away. And I think remembering that and really recognizing when I self-advocate, what are the ways that that is actually good for everyone can be a helpful reminder to tell you it's okay. And then the other thing I wanted to mention there is that sometimes it's really helpful to engage the other party in sort of a problem solving mission. So it's like, hey, here's a need I have. How can we work together to get that need met? And maybe I'm willing to be flexible about the ways that that could look, right? Like some things you maybe you'd need something very specific. But a lot of times it's like, how do I get this other person engaged and interested in solving this problem with me? And if they feel that, that is when I think you get a lot of advocacy from the people around you. I also think you deserve advocacy from your manager. And if you're not getting it, that is a signal that something maybe isn't quite right in that relationship. Because I think that's something that good managers are thinking about. Mm -hmm. There's so much to build on there and I have to start somewhere. <laughs> so I think one that we can do um, is any sort of like reflection prompts or like journaling exercises, something, how do I maybe frame this executive summary for my manager or how do I decide what exactly it is that I need to talk about? Does anyone have any strategies for deciding on that? Well, I think one thing is when you are feeling something that you want to, you know, work out with your manager, I think it's always helpful to work it out with someone else first. So it's, 
who's my buddy, who's my BFF that I can talk to and be like, okay, this is what's, what, this is what's happening. And really start to articulate that to someone else because they'll hear things that you have not, you're, you're not feeling or you're not hearing and they can play that back to you. Somebody that you trust, a trusted partner, a trusted advisor, someone is always helpful. Like I never go into a, what I, what I deem is going to be a crucial conversation cold, you know, ever. I always have had a conversation with somebody else about it beforehand. Um, and then it's, I think a little bit about what you said, Sarah, it's like, how do we, how do I, how do I state the problem or the challenge or the opportunity? And then what are some of the things, what are the outcomes I want to see? And then let's fill in the middle together that, and sometimes you end up getting to the exact same space, the exact same way that you had planned. And sometimes you'll be pleasantly surprised that people will, provide solutions that you might not have even thought of. And you're like, oh, wow, that might be cool. I mean, one thing I always expect is when I'm meeting somebody new or I'm having a difficult conversation with someone or going into a conversation where I'm, I'm kind of not sure how it's going to come out, I always go in expecting to be surprised. Somebody's going to surprise me. I don't, surprises are can be one way or another. It doesn't mean one particular thing. But the preparation with someone that you trust framing up a statement to really kind of encapsulate the opportunity or, or the area that is troubling. And then these are the things I would love to come out of this. Then it's, then it becomes, okay, how do we do that together? How do we create, how do we get to the, those outcomes? I, I love, strategy. Oh, I love that you're, you're really speaking to like, not pre-writing the story of what's going to happen. Because as soon as we like pre-write that story of, well, they're going to shoot me down, what we often end up doing is that we walk back what we wanted to say, we talk around it, we get scared, we do all of these other things. Um, and we end up in this place of conflict, right? And it, it, like conflict is real and conflict is okay, but oftentimes when we have a conflict where it's like, I need a thing, right? And it's like, I need to go to my manager to get this thing. And this, this so the conflict is between us. Anytime you can say, how do I turn that from a thing that's in between us to a problem that we're both trying to solve. So the problem's over here and here's both of us orienting toward trying to solve it. If you can, you cannot guarantee the other party will be ready to do that, right? Like if somebody comes in in a combative state, that's theirs. But I think what you can always do is say, how do I not approach this from a place of combat? Can I approach this from a place of, this is the, the issue, it's not the issue between us, it's the issue in front of us. And I think if you are able to do that, it is really helpful also for just keeping yourself accountable to like not going into a situation pre-writing the story negatively and then like I don't know displaying problematic behaviors like a lot of times if we go into those scenarios like that we start doing things that are like we blame other people we you know like well you never do this and you're always like that we go into those zones which are really counterproductive and actually don't speak to what's really wrong, which is that we have a need that is unmet. So we start dumping on other people instead of actually communicating what we need. Your two comments together really highlighted something for me, which is that one of my one of my more toxic patterns is when I and am anticipating a complex or difficult conversation, I'll flowchart it to the nth degree. Like every possible derivation thinking. of that argue of that conversation has been mapped out in my mind. And inevitably, none of those paths are the ones that get taken. And so I'm completely unprepared. Right. And so it's been a challenge for me over the years as I've sort of stepped into myself and, and greater self-advocacy to remember that like. It's the outcome I'm looking for, not the conversation. It's it's the to to really stay focused on what I what I want or need to come out of this versus how I want this conversation to go. And understanding that no matter what response you get, they are that other person is only telling you about themselves. They are incapable of talking about anybody else in the same way that you are incapable of talking. You can only talk about yourself and your perceptions of others. You can't talk about other people in the first person. And therefore you can't 
accept personally the information that they give you. It's not about you, it's about them. And so like those two things have been really powerful for me that, that disallowing myself the luxury of flow charting and saying like, okay, it's time to have the conversation because you're already starting to map it out. And then divorcing the, the emotional impact of the of the outcome from the the physical or real impact of it such that like yes i'm disappointed that it didn't work out the way that i wanted but it's not a rejection of me as a person i think that there's something really valuable dylan in, in what you're saying around like we over prepare oftentimes thinking that's going to make us more confident in the moment and actually it doesn't because it's like we now we because now we've again we've built out this huge story in our head and so when it goes off of that story we're off our game i think of it instead as like preparation is really about what do you need to do now so that you can trust future you to figure it out like how do you how are you going to trust that future you is smart and is gonna figure it out as they go versus current me has to like ward against future me who's an idiot who won't be able to figure this out so future or current me has to like do all this work for them no future you is smart they can figure it out too and like let them if anything future you is smarter because they have more experience <laughs> than you do hopefully <laughs> well inevitably they have whether that experience was good or not whether or not you interpreted the experience wisely those are different questions but inevitably more future you there. has more experience. Right, which building on that, uh, Dana, is there a specific um, story that you have to tell of, of this situation, like meta-analysis that we're doing? Is there um, a story that you can share of a time that you've gone through this process and then asked for something and then it happened or didn't happen? Anything that comes to mind in your work as an engineering manager? Yeah, becoming an engineering manager. Hey. Um, you know, like I, there came a time in my career where I was, I became, was becoming a lot more fascinated with human APIs than with technical APIs. Mm. And I wanted to work more with the human side of the equation. Um, I had also just recently started living in my, in my authentic gender. And so I was asking for, I was interviewing at jobs, asking for a promotion, wearing clothes that were unfamiliar to me, even though they felt emotionally satisfying, wearing makeup, which I wasn't used to wearing and didn't feel entirely comfortable with. And that sense of like feeling all that and doing it anyway, feeling all that and saying, yes, I feel that. And mm. by God, I have a 20 year resume. I've been in this business for a long time. I've led a lot of teams. I've done some amazing work that is empirically, indisputably, and by every measurement, amazing. What is the problem here? Right? <laughs> and so I had to go to people like, and have those, those two convert that, that angel and devil sitting on my shoulders and be like, I've never been a manager and I want you to hire me as a manager. I like the yes and I, we can talk about that concept in general of, um, but I think it's what we've all been talking about tonight is that it's very realistic what we're talking about here. Like being courageous is about being realistic and surfacing um, those, you know, mindfulness we're talking about, like being aware of things that you're experiencing. I want this thing, that's one part. I also feel this way. That's another part of it. And, and you have to factor in all the different parts of the equation of, of what you're trying to ask for so that, I mean, we can um, help our future selves be smarter by, by doing this reflection work in advance and then letting the, the cards unfold from there. Um, but also like not trying to be over positive, I guess, about the situation. You can be pessimistic, which is you never even ask in the first place, but you can also be over yeah positive and not um prepare yourself so I, I also like that portion of having the devil and the angel 
Right. You need both, right? Mm -hmm. You need both. You need the devil to be pushing you forward to try a little bit harder to continually innovate and, and, and iterate mm -hmm. on your approaches. And you need your angel to say, you're worth doing this work. Mm -hmm. This is hard and it's scary and you are worth it and you deserve it. So go out there and ask for what you need. Mm -hmm. Right. I can pick another question here while I'm getting prepared. So how does courage relate to um, burnout, generally speaking? So when we're talking about, especially like your 20 year resume and yet you've done amazing things, um, when we're also thinking about being a minority in the workplace, for example, in different ways, is how does that tap into trying to use your work and going over your 40 hour work week as like justification for you being there? Like, are, are you trying too hard? Or are you burning yourself out by not being courageous to say, I am a woman, I'm not gonna do over 40 hours just to make myself, like create my space here. Um, is there any anything that you've experienced there where you've had to say, no, I'm going to stick to my my schedule here. Or I'm going to say no to this opportunity and yes to this one. I really liked what Sarah had to say earlier about how courage isn't necessarily about pushing forward. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's about withdrawing. Sometimes it's about saying I've had enough. Sometimes it's about saying I need a break. Um, I was at my last employer. I was, I, I accepted the job, it was in auto retail. Right? I was working in auto retail and my first tech job back in the mid nineties had been in auto retail. And when I left that job, I said, I'm never working in that sector again. <laughs> Rolexes, Italian shoes, big egos, I don't need it. <laughs> but a few years ago, these folks came to me, they talked, they said a lot of great things and I felt like yeah, I can make a difference here and I can, I can teach them how to build diverse teams and I can teach them how to build an inclusive, psychologically safe workplace. And I can, I can, I can bring that value to this table. And I worked really hard at that for several months and it didn't, didn't work. <laughs> it, it didn't work. They didn't want to learn at, a, at least at an organizational level, they didn't want to learn what I had to teach. And so once that realization comes to you, it's no longer a them problem. It's now a you problem. And now you, you are forced to make a choice. Either you choose to stay or you choose to leave, right? But it, you can be tilting at the windmills, you can choose to stay and continue to tilt at windmills and you know where that's gonna end. Or you can say, there are other organizations that can better benefit from what I have to offer. There are other contexts that can better benefit from what I have to offer. It's not necessarily about leaving a job, right? It can be about leaving a context or a situation, but like recognizing when you 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 have met an immovable object mm -hmm. is self-care. Recognizing that you cannot have an impact here is self-care. And it is courageous and brave and true to say, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of playing Sisyphus and I'm not going to do it anymore. And like that, that's not my failing, right? That's their failing, right? right? Like that's them. That's on them. I don't, I don't have to destroy myself for this. And the fact that I have been, the fact that I have brought everything I did to this and they remained close to it that's a them problem that's disappointing and you you may have many many feelings about it and that's okay but to remember that that's not because you are personally a failure i also think fundamentally okay like look 
I want to speak up on behalf of what is equitable and what is right. And I think I feel like it is um, an imperative that I do that um, for groups that experience bias I don't experience. I don't think it's my job, though, to like fix society for women because I'm a woman. It's actually not my job. It explicitly shouldn't be my job. I choose to take on some of that work because it is meaningful to me. But I think if you look at that as something that's like your job, then it starts to feel like it's is that burden. And if I fail at it, it's like I'm failing women. No, society is failing women. Like that is not a, that's like that's not me, right? Like if you, somebody doesn't want to listen to that. And so I think about it as like where is it? Where do I have a responsibility? And I would say, you know, the more if you look at where you have privilege in your life um, by virtue of gender, race, class, wealth, stability, health, many, many factors, look for those places where you have privilege. And that's where I think you have the greater responsibility to do something. And in the places where you have less, it is not your fault that like people did not want to listen to you. And you chose to give them what we were able or willing to give them at that time. And then you chose to walk away when they were not receptive. That's great. That's not a failure. That is actually a personal win. That is that is you setting a boundary. Yeah, thanks for calling that out. All right. We are 10 minutes to the close, but I have one more question that um, builds on everything we talked about in a different way. Um, and specifically, it's for Neville. Um, I know, like in your bio, you specifically call it multi generational. And I remember a conversation I had in college on Facebook when Trump was elected. I would have a different opinion than someone else in my network. And there was an argument and someone came into the thread and said, don't worry, Kaylin, this type of thinking will die out eventually, <laughs> which was harsh. And, you know, people have different approaches to advocacy and there, there's a can of worms to talk about there. But the, but the point of that being, what is your experience seeing, um, what, what kind of problems do you address related to courage and, and speaking up for yourself in multi-generational workplaces? Yeah, so a lot of a lot of a lot of places, especially now, there's well, even before COVID, there were some of the large organizations that I that I tend to work with have this mix of people that have been there forever. They know where all the bodies are buried, like they know everything about everything. And then there's a there's a, another wave of folks that are relatively uh, kind of growth mindset people that naturally growth mindset people that are just always kind of testing the status quo, ask why, and I ask five whys all the time. So it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of just, you know, that's kind of human nature for some people. And so you bring these two different perspectives together. In some cultures that could be, and I'm saying organizational cultures, that could be a recipe for a disaster. And if they're not willing to listen to each other, if they're not willing to understand how do they work together to get to the outcomes. And so in a multi-generational uh, organization or family or neighborhood, it's always around, what are we really trying to achieve? Because if you really, if you take away all the, all the backstory or what I believe, what you believe, like what are we really trying to get to? And that starts to build kind of a bridge across different generations that think differently, you know, um, different cultures that think differently. Um, Cause usually everyone's trying to get to the same outcome, especially in at work, right? We, we have a goal, we have a customer we're trying to serve. We have a service that we're trying to provide. Let's get to that and let's use outcomes as a way to, you know, kind of rubble our way through. You do it this way and I do it this way, you know? Cause that's usually what it gets down to. Well, we've always done it this way. And this is the way it's supposed to be done. And somebody's saying, well, we can actually do it a different way. And okay, so let's not argue about the way. Let's align on the why. Why is this important? And why does it make sense? And when you can get those two experiences of people together to get, you, you can come up with such an amazing outcome. People start to learn more about themselves. They start to get to a better end result. But it takes a lot of patience. It takes people being quiet and listening to people letting them have their <laughs> opportunity to talk about what's bothering them um, and not taking it personal. If you, if you, 
people take things too personal when it comes to those type of conversations. Let's just talk about what, what's happening. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's really important to me because most organizations, you know, now a lot of people have decided, I don't want to even deal with it. So I'm, you know, this, I'm leaving, this great resignation is happening and I'm going mm -hmm. to find something and work for a culture that is in alignment with my beliefs. Um, and I love that. Um, but there are people that can't can't do that, and they're still st they still have to stay in some of those types of environments. So, you know, being more listening and being more empathetic for people, um, because we never know why people are feeling the way they are. Whether it's because of their their age in a particular industry, they feel like they're you know they're being replaced. Um, you know, you have to come in there with with more of an empathetic ear. That's that's great. It's very. Um... But there has been that common thread throughout is like the psychology of us versus them. And, and we hate to them at all, but in terms of like aligning yourselves and positioning yourselves as we're on the same side here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's kind of a theme and, and it's it's a practical takeaway is like making sure that we're aligning and like as Sarah pointed out, not for the purpose of pleasing the other person, but in service of the ultimate goal and and still bringing your individual approach to the conversation. Um, thanks, Anna. Um, I think what would be great to wrap up on is if everyone, um, Sarah, um, Neville, and Dalen, if you could each do like a minute of a, a wrap up, like one big takeaway for you from this conversation. You can start with uh, Neville since you're, <laughs> you're okay. Awesome. I would say lean into what you believe to be true about yourself. The thing that you know you have your greatest strength, work on that, like focus on your greatest strength and make that even greater as opposed to focusing on your weakness and making it, yeah, you know, <laughs> you can push your weakness to make it a little bit better. But if you are living in your purpose and you're living in the strength of yourself, I'm a, I'm a communicator, I, am a, I love people. And so I'm not that good financially, but I'm a CEO of a consulting firm. I'm not going to lean into that. Like, not mm -hmm. my thing. I need to make sure I got the right people. I'm going to lean into the area that I believe I can have the biggest impact. So find what that is and then just knock it out the park. Love that. <laughs> Are you ready? I had a thing in my sorority. It's about snapping. Every time someone said something great, I'm like, yes. <laughs> so Daylin, you're up next. Was the beat poet sorority? <laughs> Should have been, yeah. Sorry, I just dated myself, but um, <laughs> I think I think few processes in my life have been as impactful as getting really clear about what my values are and being able to hang language on those words. And being able to carry that around and use that as a rubric against any context I'm in. Is this in alignment with my values? No? Okay. I'm going to go find something that is in alignment with my values. Being able to have that rubric, being able to not have to improvise the language around my values, and being able to say with absolute clarity, these are the things that are most important to me. It's radically transformed my relationship with work, my relationships with people, my relationship with money. And I, I think like, if that's not a process you've gone through, it's worth the time. There it is, there's the snaps. <laughs> Round us off, Sarah. Dylan, I love that and I, I mean, this is it's a high high bar to be like sum it all up so i think i'm just i'm i'm thankful for you both for sharing things that i'm like oh, i don't have to say that now i think okay with all of that it's like know yourself know what you need i think remember that courage is not about doing more all of the time courage is about understanding yourself and allowing those needs to exist and allowing yourself to get those needs met and it can be speaking up and it can be walking away and it can be a ton of other things. Courage is really about noticing when you're scared and then choosing what is actually going to serve you and your values anyway. And you do not owe everybody your, 
like taking on the burden of pushing and pushing and pushing for everything all the time. That's not what it means to be courageous. What it means to be courageous is to continually stay in that self-knowledge and to continually use that self-knowledge to make choices that are in alignment. And that is hard. And that is actually incredibly valuable. And I think that's what Dalen just said is that it's changed her life. It's changed my life. I think it's probably changed a lot of people's lives. And to, to, to build that self-trust is in a lot of ways, I think the most courageous thing. Snaps. Perfect. Thank you so much, Neville and Dalen and Sarah. I cannot stress enough how awesome this conversation was. It's, it's, timely it's, it's always the right time to talk about being courageous and being you and bringing your power to a space and, and doing what's right for you i want to watch this recording three thousand times and pull all the amazing information that came out of it um i i will uh, send out an email blast and meet up so if you want to receive a notification about the recording uh, please do make sure that your notifications are turned on so you can receive that information um neville dalen sarah thank you again one more time um, for everything, all of your background and, and perspective that you brought today. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day, um, our panelists and, and to our attendees. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylin, for organizing. Thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Hi, Dale. Nice Kaylin. to meet you. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, nice, nice to meet you all. <laughs>